taking a look at um, the state of the black community, what's going on. And um, <clears throat> I think it's time for real soldiers and warriors, people who love black folks. The condition for this meeting, I didn't go up on BON, I didn't go up on social media, whether we had 10 people or we had 20 people, I was going to be all right with that because we have to move in a way now that's very serious and very deliberate. My role is to help be one, be one of the conveners. I'm not looking to be the leader. We're not in that season now. And so I personally reached out to each person and said to them, uh, you come and you bring somebody that you can vouch you for. So I didn't just want anybody coming because I wanted us to have a a certain kind of committed spirit. And the frame of reference for inviting people, inviting people, either I know you and your work, or I know your work from Lou and George County. And so, and I believe that you have a committed love for our people. So we're very serious about getting the message to our people and getting people reorganized. We're not here to support a candidate. That's not what this is about. If you have a candidate, that's on you, but that's not what this meeting is about. Today, we're going to hear from our brother interpreting what's going on in white life and black life as nobody else can. I don't, I've been listening to Tom Todd for 35 years. Um, Lou Palmer had a few people that he would reach out to. And if we couldn't get Tom Todd, he wouldn't hold a rally. Because Tom Todd was traveling, and back then, many of you remember in the 80s, we were doing a dump daily rally. And if he could blue, he would set the meeting around whether or not Tom Todd was in town. And Tom doesn't need an introduction, but I would say it this way. Lou had a word that most of you know he would say, we put it on the wall outside. It's enough to make a Negro turn black. I would say that a world without Tom Todd is enough to make a Negro turn black. Read my brother Ron because I have the insight to lean us in the bosom of Lou Palmer and Georgia Palmer. When I talked about it, we knew it was the election season. And I wanted to talk about elections and candidates and black people. I wanted to talk about the fact that there is power in the ballot. There is power in the ballot. Not to talk about the ballot of the bullet, but there is power in the ballot. And so I'm going to spend some time with you for a little while today to talk about this electoral process and what's going on and what it means from my perspective to black people and what we should do, in my opinion. As I listen to radio, I don't have a television. I threw away my television in 1992. Just as James Blue Singer said, quiet as it's kept, I can do bad all by myself. <laughs> I don't need television to help make me ignorant. <laughs> but before I go into that, I'd appreciate it if we go around the room and stand up and introduce yourselves. I know most of you, and some of you know me and some of you know other people, so stand up starting and tell us who you are so we'll know who we're talking to and welcome home. Thank you, it's good to be here and feel good and proud. My name is Barbara Norman, Dr. Norman. I'm the former deputy with Hair of Washington, many of you know. We were the founder of the Hair of Washington Party, many of you know. I'm a member of trustee at W. Baptist Church right down the street, and I follow many of you, know many of you, and I'm glad to be here and hope to come more often. Thank you. I'm a model boss. I'm a construction company. <laughs> Brown Blue Builder is the name of the company. Right. How about you? My name is Brother Farney Muhammad. Very proud card carrying member of the Nation of Islam under the leadership of Minister Louis Farrakhan. I'm your brother. I am a long, long time uh, helper and supporter of. Our brother Lou Palmer and brother Eddie Reed, and uh, an advocate in the in social services in the community. And um, we are the BD, read each one of you when we get through. Thank you. I'm Sam Hayes. 
Sam Ray. <clears throat> I used to show with Lou Palmer and Mrs. Palmer. Got told off frequently. Since then, I've been the building engineer in here. And whatever you see that need fixing, it's my job to get it fixed. If it don't, I catch H-E-L-L. -L. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say that Sam, with, a, with our trainees, built this room. This room was a garage with a dirt floor. Wow. It was a garage with a dirt floor. That man right there uh, took control of it, and what you see in here today is at his hand. <laughs> Brother Jeffrey Muhammad, Assistant uh, Minister, Brother Dennis Muhammad, I'm the regional protocol director for the Nation of Islam and the leadership of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I'm Brother Robert, Chicago Black United Communities and Beppo member. Wouldn't be here today without it. My name is Jess from the BP with Urban Construction. I used to specialize in waste hauling, I mean waste hauling. You kind of do things that don't nobody else do. That would probably keep us in trouble all the time. <laughs> Fred Riley, I'm a master electrician. I also do a little welding. I have three apprentices currently. And they'll probably be my last three. I'm an entrepreneur. And I do a lot of things behind the scenes that a lot of people don't know about. But I do get things done. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Reverend David Anderson, uh, I'm part of Steve Bugs Bill and uh, just a supporter of Brother Eddie Reed and everything that they do around this place and uh, try to get things happen. Good afternoon, I'm Maureen Forte, I've been the Dover Small Business for 15 years in towns, and I'm with the families of the wrongfully convicted. And Eddie says something's going on. If I'm not there, because I didn't turn out in town. That's my mama, y'all. Mm -hmm. All right. That's my mama. All right. Good afternoon. I'm Sharon Lee Hall. I'm a member of the Kenwood Open Community Organization, a uh, community organizer, and I'm also. Um, recently director of an organization called the Journey for Justice Alliance. It's 37 community-based organizations in about 24 cities that's fighting against privatization education and uh, trying to get community control of school. Brother Ryan, and Brother Robert, Seba, Bippo, Electronics Tech, and Automotive Expert. Mm -hmm. I'm Sammy Muhammad, and I run a West Side organization called North Star for Youth Development. I'm Keith Muhammad uh, from the West Side. I'm a community organizer, primarily in the 27 Ward. Yes, that's me. Uh, my name is Jamal Julian. Uh, I, uh, I'm the co-founder of an organization called Slow Road Chicago, and I also uh, have a real estate brokerage in previously have worked as a controls engineer for a company called Johnson Controls. You walked in just in time to give your name, brother, and identify yourself. Uh, my name is Gil O'Bank. People know me as Noon. Brother Kareem. Okay. Is that everybody now? Give yourself a round of applause. Thank you. We've got enough right here for this paper.
papers and people talking about blacks in the United States Constitution. Talking about voting and what the election means to this person and that person. And really, I haven't heard anyone discuss what the election means to black people. We have a tendency to listen to the commentary. And we have a tendency to use words like Democrat and Republican. I don't do that. I use the words Republicans and Democrats. Because when I look at where we are in the history, and that's, and that's important. We, the thing that has happened so often now is that as I talk to some of our young people, they have no concept of a history. They don't know where they've come from in terms of the movement and what have you. They don't know where they are, where they're going. And the one thing that we have to always teach and always deal with is deal with the history. No building, not even this fine structure can stand without a foundation. And no tree can live without its roots. And no people can survive without an understanding of their history. We must know the past so that we understand the present and plan for the future. We don't use history as a blueprint. We use history as a guide. It's not going to be the same thing over and over again. But we need to know that so that when they are telling us things, and we were listening to things, we understand what they're doing. I wanted to start off with, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed with their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Well, that's not for you. That's not yours. Now, you may embrace it, but that's not yours. And before we leave here today, we will understand how they use those words now to so-called be inclusive, but rather what Iran, they are not inclusive. They didn't include us then. They don't include us now. And so we look at where we are. And it was interesting when I talked to Brother Ron as we came over, he is a true immigrant, son of immigrants. He is a true son of immigrants. Most of us are not. We didn't come here through Ellis Island with cardboard suitcases yearning to breathe free. We came here through the Middle Passage. You don't, you don't ever need to forget that. We came here as kidnapped persons to be sold into slavery. Now that's important because once you understand that, then you understand how we are viewed during this period of time because there are still badges of slavery and in issue of servitude in 2014. We were commodities. We were brought here to be sold as commodities. And we are still commodities. We are still used. And we are still used for the benefit of other people. So when we talk about where we are and looking at where we are, most of you don't read, and I love you, but how many of you have read the 13th Amendment in the last six months? How many of you have read the 14th Amendment in the last six months? How many of you, you see, this is what I'm saying. How many of you have read the Emancipation Proclamation? Ever. And yet we deal with it over and over again as so-called freedom of black people. Black people were freed by Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln didn't free anybody. He was a melancholy, incurable racist. And that's history. Don't get mad at me. I didn't write this history. But he was a, he was a white supremacist. Read the Lincoln-Douglas debates yeah, that's right. in 1858. Read. See, the thing about it, if we're going to teach our children and teach the persons behind us, we've got to know what to teach. We've got to know what and understand what we're talking about. And in many instances, we're just not there. In 1776, the Declaration of Independence, which I just read, did not include black people. Black people in this country, for the most part of that time, they were chattel property, slaves. And when all when the white men wrote this Declaration of Independence, they, had, they didn't have in mind us. Later on, we were told that blacks in the 1789 
The United States Constitution were mentioned in one section. What section was that? You know, I'm going to give y'all a test. You know, we believe, <laughs> just, we believe in giving tests now. Y'all yes, better take some notes. Yes, Thank you. Article 1, Section 3 of the Constitution viewed black people only as three-fifths of a person for apportionment and taxation. Not a whole man, not a whole woman, but three-fifths of a person. And you need to understand that's what was being done. That was 1789. And then in 1857, in the Dred Scott decision, how many of you read the Dred Scott decision? Recently, ever? Don't raise your hand because I'll, I'll ask you some questions about it. You know, I used to teach. Yes, sir. <laughs> Dred Scott decision in 1857, Roger B. Taney stated in that decision that blacks were beasts of birth, that they were not human, that when words like person, and words like citizens were used in the Declaration of Independence and used in the Constitution, it did not refer to black people born and unborn. Come on. And so as a result of that, when we deal with that, we look at this and we, we listen to the history and we believe what we hear. Don't believe what you hear. That's right. Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in what year? You're right, 1863, January 1st. We still have parades, Emancipation Proclamation parades, as if we are free. When he signed the Emancipation Proclamation to save the Union, not to free black slaves, he turned some blacks loose. He did not free them. Why do I say that? I say it because how can you be free if you don't have the right to vote? How can you be free if you can't get an education? How can you be free if you don't have 40 acres and a mule? And so Abraham Lincoln turned a few black people loose. The Emancipation Proclamation is one of the greatest examples of the okie doke that I have ever read in history. Now y'all have heard of the okie doke, but what is the okie doke? You ever, you ever read a definition of the okie doke? Well, that's why we're here today. The okie-doke is a thing or promise given as if it has great value, when in fact it is useless, always designed to deceive, given often but not always by posturing, pontificating, and picture-taking politicians. <laughs> the okie-doke. And when you fall for the okie-doke, you're put in a trick bag. What's the definition of a trick bag? A trick bag. And we say it every day, but you see, we have to define what is ours. A trip, a trip bag is a trap caused by deception, which is accepted because of a perceived special relationship between the trapped and the trapper. So when Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, he put black people in a trip bag. They didn't have anything. They went back to the plantation. They went back to sharecropping mm -hmm. because they didn't, have, they didn't even have anything on their backs. Right. And so once that was done, blacks couldn't vote, blacks couldn't serve on juries, blacks couldn't own property, blacks couldn't testify against whites mm -hmm. in Illinois. If a black person killed another black person, there would be no testimony that could come in Strike that. If a white person killed a black person, and the only witnesses were blacks against that white person, that person could not be tried. I didn't write this history, but you ought to read the history and make sure you understand the context of it over and over again. We couldn't serve on juries. We couldn't own property. We couldn't enter into contracts. And once we got past the formal slavery, then blacks were determined and described officially as being idiots, as being infected with all sorts of diseases, living in squalor, ignorance and indolence, and notoriously ignorant and debased and degraded and mentally diseased over and over again because the policy in America and the feeling in America, and I, again, you need to know this history so you can understand where we are now. Blacks were considered inherently 
not assumed, but inherently inferior. And so as a result of that, the Constitution didn't deal with it. I listened to you over and over again talking about blogging and talking about all of this electronic device, all of these devices and what have you on the internet, which we didn't, I guess Al Gore invented it, but we don't own anything with it. And so you look at me and I'm still turning these pages in this notebook, and you say to me, look at him, he, he, he ain't got no Blackberry, he, he, he don't text, he don't, he, don't, he, he don't blog, he don't tweet, and you're absolutely right. And you know why? Because with all of your technology, with all of the things that you have, you still can't download freedom. Well, listen to me, there's no app for that. Come on, if you're going to be free, you're going to have to work for it, and that's what has always happened. But we stopped working because we're using devices which we didn't invent, which we don't understand, and we think that we have now arrived. Well, I know that you are running on the information superhighway, but I want you to know that I still walk on a dirt road. Because I'm from Alabama, and I believe in the fundamentals that we're dealing with. So what is this voting? What is this election? What are you getting ready for? Do you know? You know what they tell you on television. You know what they tell you on the radio. Well, you know what I am from Alabama? And in 1960, I took a two and a half hour literacy test to qualify the vote. Mm. I had to interpret the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. Fortunately, I had graduated from Southern University with a degree in political science and had studied constitutional law. So I wrote that due process is whatever is a part of our ordered scheme of liberty, whatever is fundamentally fair, whatever the Supreme Court says, when this registrar took my paper, he looked at it and he said, I guess you passed, but I knew he couldn't understand what I wrote. He had my paper upside down. <laughs> but in Alabama, in Mobile, that was easy. In Birmingham, it was how many bubbles in a bar of soap? How many grains of sand in a jar? Why? Because they really didn't want black people to vote. That's why. Medgar Evers was killed trying to register black people to vote. Michael Cheney, Schroeder, and Goodman killed in the Shogun County trying to register to vote. But wait a minute, this is a democracy. And in a participatory democracy, the Supreme Court has said that the most precious right is the right to vote. It protects all other rights. So, so what is this? Well, as you are seeing right now in Chicago, whenever there is an election, there will be ultimately a winner and loser for the office, but they're already winners. If you spend $100 million to run for governor between two candidates, basically, somebody has already won. Television stations, media buys, radio stations. You see, so that the electoral process becomes big business. Consultants and experts, even before the polls open, That's right. they're already winners. And then if you spend a hundred million dollars on a gubernatorial race, and you spend three billion dollars on a presidential race, do you think that those people who put in that money up are doing because they believe in civics and good government. But you know, here is the key. Here is the key that you should never forget. They are doing all of this to get your vote. Listen to me, because there is an obsession in this country with the perception of participatory democracy. Yes. Mm. So they want to give the impression that they're really taking the vote but what has really happened is they're using your vote for somebody else's benefit. Yes, there is power in the ballot, but the power is exercised by you for the benefit of somebody else. Well, oh, I've got to say that again. You need to understand that. It is, you go vote, you go vote. And you go vote, why? You go vote because somebody told you on television that this is a good person, this is a bad person, 
you're not going to do your own research. And that's why we end up using our vote and it benefits somebody else and not us because we are not intelligently casting the ballot. We are not intelligently casting the ballot. And so what they do never ceases to amaze me. I told you that I took a two and a half hour literacy test in Alabama, right? That's right. To qualify the vote. They've been talking about voter ID. That's going to stop people from voting. This is a sample ballot. There are people in Chicago who can't read this ballot. Mm -hmm. So is this the new literacy test? Mm -hmm. Is this the new literacy test? Mm -hmm. There are 75 or 80 judges on here. Mm -hmm. You don't even, you have never heard of them. Yes. So how can you vote for them? How can you look at these, at these officers here and all of it, all of us don't have the ability to read and write and study all the time. So is this really a ballot in a participatory democracy or is it a shame? Wow. <coughs> I looked at this ballot, I said to myself, and I read all of it, and I filled in everything, because if you don't fill it in, somebody's gonna fill it in downtown. That's right. And so when I went through this whole ballot and I voted, I said to myself, this ballot is set up so that seniors can't handle it, that disabled people can't handle it, that people who can barely, we do have some people who can barely read and write in this city, they can't handle this. So this ballot is set up so that they, the people who get the ballot can be either told how to vote or have somebody vote for them. Now you know that. Isn't that plain? So why hasn't someone filed a lawsuit to challenge this ballot as being unconstitutional? Mm -hmm. That this denies equal protection of the law. It is an obsession with the perception of democracy. Not actual democracy. They, don't want, to, they want to be able to count your votes and say, listen, we got these votes from them so that you can give me this. But what about them? They don't get anything. Oh, yes, they do. They get zero. And I took math. I'm not a big mathematician, but I learned that zero plus zero, zero, zero times zero, zero, zero divided by zero. zero. <laughs> and so we look at this and we just take it for granted. We've got enough lawyers and enough people who could study this and say that this ballot is unconstitutional because it's impossible for the average person to read and understand. <clears throat> so why haven't we challenged this ballot? Why are we still talking about Republican and Democrat? Mm -hmm. Now, the reason I say that, because I'm 76 years old, I'm old. Mm -hmm. But when I was in Alabama, when we could not vote, I didn't know anything about the Democratic Party, Republican Party, even a Harold Washington Party. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about the Libertarian Party or the Green Party. All I knew was one fact, and that is that the white people in Alabama would not allow me to vote. And yet, as we see all of this now, we see all of this posturing. In North Carolina, they're putting out flyers that if you vote for Republicans, black people, you're going to go back to slavery. In Georgia, they're putting out flyers with the young brothers with their hands in the air saying, if you vote for Republicans, then you're going to have Ferguson, Missouri. Come on, come on, come on. That's right. Don't you know what is happening? They are banking on your ignorance. Right. <coughs> and you know what? They're right. We're not teaching. We're not teaching each other. If you want to know the history of it, and I lived in Alabama, all of the segregationists and the Jim Crow people in Alabama were Democrats. That's right, that's right. But they were white, so we didn't make a distinction. Hmm. George Wallace? Hmm. Jerome Thurman? Yeah. Bill Moore in Georgia? Talmadge? Right. Folsom in Alabama? 
All I'm saying to you is you can vote Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, but make sure your vote is informed. You know how we are? We join into organizations and we become more committed to the organization than we do to our people. True. Blacks who are in the Democratic Party are more Democratic than the Democrats and the Republicans are more Republican than the Republicans. We're committed. Yet if you remember what happened with Harold Washington, when Harold won the primary, they are in the Pisky left the party. Say it, say it right there. Well, yet we're still here. This is a lesson you must teach our brothers and sisters who didn't know. That's why we wanted to come here today so that we can deal with this so you'll have something to teach. Well, well, Attorney Chard is talking about being anti-white. I am talking about the historical facts. True facts. We'll go next Tuesday. We'll cast a ballot. And what are they saying now in, in Arkansas and Louisiana and all of these states? It is the black vote that will make Say a difference. It. Come on now. That's what they're saying. So they fought among themselves. And now they've got to depend upon the black vote. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> Why should the black vote go to you? Or go over here? And I know what the answer to it is in these quarters. They don't have any way else to go. And they're fools. Oh yeah, fool me once. Fool me twice. Fool me over and over again. I must like to be fooled. <laughs> so the first lesson that we deal with here is that we don't get caught up in any label. Yes, the issue for us is what are you going to do with my vote to deal with not a job for me, not a contract for you, not something for the individual. What, are you, what is my vote going to do for the collective whole yeah. and not the connected few? Yes, for the whole community, we need a job. We need a thousand jobs for young black men, young black women. Don't give me a contract. We need quality education for our kids. That's what our vote should translate into. Not somebody else's power. I would not care whether or not one party or the other party controls a house in the United States Congress unless it's going to translate into something concrete for me. That's right. That's right. Bill Clay in the 70s said no permanent interests, no permanent friends, no permanent enemies, only permanent interests. What has happened to us? Why have we been duped? Why have we gone for the okie doke? Where is the black agenda? Mm. Who is working on the black agenda? So you, you, you can't do that. You're playing the race card. Well, you can talk about the black vote being the difference. Why can't I talk about an agenda for black people to benefit black people from their votes? From their votes. Oh, they don't want you to think like that. They pay millions of dollars to experts and people on television to convince you of otherwise. Yes, that's right. They bring in celebrities. And yes, they bring yes. in all these big shots. And you know what? You are more powerful than they are yeah. because you've got one vote and they can't vote at all. Mm. Oh, but you don't look at that. You, mm. you say, well, if, uh, if XYZ uh, is in favor of ABC, mm. then I must be in favor of ABC. Mm. When are we going to break those chains? When are we going to have our own agenda? Everybody else does. What happened to us? You want to make me angry? You want to disturb me? 
Let me hear these groups talk about being just like the civil rights movement. <laughs> we are the new civil rights movement. I know, I'm not, I don't care how worthy your issue is, it is not the same. Say it. No group in this country Never. has ever been declared less than human. That we had to address the issue of humanness before we could address the human that the issue of voting. Hmm. Oh, it's all right if you want to copy us. That's right. But don't tell me it's just like your movement. We marched and we demonstrated, and some people died in the 60s and 50s. Yeah, that's right. Come on now. And yet now, there are groups that are using our yes. own history, right. and we walked away from our own history. Right. Even in China, they are singing, we shall overcome. Right. Come on now. Come in on their now. demonstration. And yet, I guess we think that all we have to do is push a button. Mm. All we have to do is pull a lever. We don't have to work anymore. Mm. Mm. The question that we have to ask and answer is why have blacks become spectators of their own parade, marching to a drum major from somebody else's band, marching to somebody else's music? When will we learn? When will we wake up? When will we understand that it is a part of the democratic way to get a return on your investment, which is your ballot? That's right. If we are 25 to 30 percent of an organization called a political party, why aren't we getting 25 or 30 percent of a return on the ballot? We don't, we don't ask that. I took the literacy test in Alabama to Colorado vote. When I got to Chicago, I said, well, Negroes in Chicago have been voting a long time. They didn't vote. I didn't know that the vote was being bought for <coughs> turkeys and hams and watermelons and wine and five dollars. <laughs> then they moved away from that and got a little more sophisticated, but still buying the vote. <coughs> so how do they buy it now? They buy it with grants and they buy it with contracts and they buy it with all of these things for individuals. <coughs> Jobs and they battle with what? Hope, history, and pride. Mm -hmm. Oh, y'all need to think about that. Yes, sir. But they're still buying the vote, and we're still empty when it's over. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. There are four steps in this electoral process you must register the vote, that gives you the power to vote. <coughs> Then you must have voter education that teaches you how to vote in your own best interest. <coughs> then you must have voter participation. You turn out and vote. But this is the one where we lose it. Post-election participation. After, after Tuesday, we're going to sit down. There's an election in 2015. Mm. So there's an election in 2016. So if you made me promises during the 2014 election, I've got a scorecard. Yeah. Right. And if you didn't do what you said oh, you were going to do, you go. Right. But we don't do that. But that's what participation is about. We can't give our children a position in the state capitol. We can't give this young brother a seat at the table in the state capitol, mm -hmm. although we may elect the next governor. Mm -hmm. well, some of you weren't here when I made my prediction. Would you like to know my prediction about the next governor? Oh. The next governor of the state of Illinois will be a white man. <laughs> <laughs> Informal slavery, 
They used black warriors to fight each other about whose plantation was nice. They used black warriors to fight each other about whose slave master was kindest. Tell me what has changed. The elders taught me in Alabama that the more things change, And since black people have always been overcharged and shortchanged, always count your change. <laughs> oh, but Frederick <laughs> Douglass had it best. You know what Frederick Douglass said? Beware of old snakes in new skin. Ooh, That's right. As education, mm. Brother Brown, we did what you're doing now in the 60s and 70s. So why do we still have to do it now? We've got the ballot, but our ballot has always been used for the benefit of somebody else. I went to all segregated schools in Alabama, from elementary school through law school. And what I found out, whether you have the SAT or the ACT or the LSAT, or whether you have charter or choice or what have you, one plus one still equals two. If you learn one plus one equals two, you know it everywhere. Oh, but we become so sophisticated until we want to make sure that we evaluate the circumstances to determine what is in the best interest of all, all of this curriculum. All the schools are good schools if you teach, if you educate. We come from a people of warriors and warrioresses. We've always fought. You're not fighting anymore. Why have we stopped fighting? Why haven't we stood up and looked at our history and fought? We don't march anymore, few of us do. We don't demonstrate anymore, few of us do. But the history of blacks in this country is that we've always fought in formal slavery. We were always trying to get free. In the post formal slavery era, we were always trying to get free. That's what the civil rights movement was about. That's what Montgomery was about. 381 days of boycotting. It brought the Montgomery bus system to his knees. I only quarrel with Dr. King and E.D. Nixon and the people who organized the Montgomery boycott. Mm -hmm. Is what they found out when blacks stopped riding the bus is that blacks were 70% of the ridership. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're 70% of the ridership, you shouldn't worry about trying to sit in the front of the bus. You ought to own the whole damn bus company. That's what we have to think about and how we can do. But as long as they've got us caught up on labels and parties and not in our own best interests, that's what I'm trying to say. There's nothing wrong with what I call constructive selfishness. What does that mean? He said selfishness. When you fly throughout this country, they say if you need oxygen, put the mask on yourself first. <laughs> because if you can't get the oxygen, if you can't breathe, you can't help anybody else. How can you help somebody when you need help yourself? How can you serve somebody when you don't have anything to serve? It's not new with me. This is our history. You should go back and look at the fighters. Look at Delaney and Turner and Beast, Garnett and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Tubman and Ida B. Wells. So tell the truth. They fought. Did my visa said, be careful now. So do not disclose your plans in the presence yeah, that's right. of those Negroes who take old coats from the master. Yeah. Yeah. Because they will betray you.
you that Turner would still be hiding now. Mm. Yeah. Some house enslaved black people. Mm. They said, I know where he is, and they took it home took to the it. mess. Took it. They weren't black. The more things change, mm. they just stay the same. That's where we are. Mm. That's how I see our role in an historic circumstance for ourselves. What's wrong with doing something for yourself? But we were all programmed to serve somebody else. To use our ballot, the power in our ballot, so that other young people can go to college and other young people can work in political organizations. And our children fighting each other on the street. No job. No affordable housing. No educational opportunity. And yet we think that we have arrived because we're going to vote on November 4th. Because we are going to use that ballot to empower somebody else. In 1933, Carter G. Woodson, yes, that Carter G. Woodson, the father of black history, Carter G. Woodson wrote, it does not matter, hear me, hear me, it does not matter who is in power. Those who have not learned to provide for themselves and must depend upon somebody else will have no more rights and privileges in the end than you had in the beginning. That's, that's 1933. Why don't we know this history? Why are we using this history? Douglas, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. <laughs> Those who profess the faith of freedom, but who deprecate agitation, are men and women who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want the ocean without the awful row of its many waters. They want all of this and not sacrifice. The blue singer says, say, everybody wants to smile. Nobody wants to cry. Everybody wants to be told the truth. But everybody wants to lie. Oh, listen to our history. Everybody wants to go to heaven. But nobody wants to die. What we are talking about here now is using the democratic process, using the lawful process. Malcolm, by any lawful means necessary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Douglas concludes that power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did and it never will. Never did and it never will. You may not get all that you paid for in this world. Look out now. But you surely, will pay surely, surely. all that you get. That's what we must teach our children. Teach them that education is the key. Teach them that they, that they can compete with their own history. They don't have to adopt somebody else's history. That's right. That's right. Well, they won't study. Yes, they will study. They'll shoot basketball 24 hours a day. They see a relationship between basketball and money. And money is America's God. America's God is money. Yes, they will study. And they will lose the money. You can lose money. You can lose wealth. But you can't lose your commitment to your people. And you can't lose your education. So I leave you with the words of the blues singer. You've heard me say it before. And it's mine. I love it. I loved her. But she told us many, many years ago, rich relations may be a crust of bread and yeah. such. Yeah. You can help yourselves, but okay. you better not take Don't too take much. much. Your mama may have, your papa may have. Help me now, but God, that's the child. That's got his own. That's got his own. That's got his own. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.